Okay, hey fellow tennis nerds, I'm here with Evan Gadro, uh, a guest contributor and an analyst who loves tennis. He coaches tennis, he's been coaching tennis on college level and played on college level himself. And uh, yeah, he loves analyzing matches. He has his daughter that he trains. So I thought we'll get into the weeds about some of the interesting topics and concepts that he's, um, he's talked about in his writing on Tennis Nerds. So you probably read that. Yeah, and so based on that, some of that writing that I've been doing, I just want to point the fact out that I'm not against some of the players I pick on. I pick on myself just as much as I pick on those guys. But, um, but sometimes they, they leave it open to, uh, to interpretation, so I interpret it my way. It's funny. It's like when you get a text message and someone says something on a text message, you read it the wrong way. And if you, So some people might read my, my pieces and, and say, that guy's you know, a little aggressive on this guy. But <laughs> yeah. like I, I'm, just, I'm all for fun. I'm all for joking around. And, uh, yeah. I think you can read that from your writing because it's kind of like tongue in cheek or a lot of it. And I think that's, that's pretty fun in Tennessee. We don't see a lot of that writing. So I think that's what I, why I like about it as well. When I pick on Brooksby, he, he cracks me up. Like I like the kid. I, his antics on the court kind of like get my, my blood boiling a little bit, but then I, I relax and I say, well, let's see how this guy does in three years, three, four years. And I'm sure he'll be fine. Like he's, I think back to like, you know, training when I was a kid and, and wanting to play at the pro level for like these guys do. And then looking back on my life, if I look at myself at 19 or 20 years old, I'm not the guy you wanted on the pro tour. I would have been worse than curious. I would have like not saying <laughs> okay, right. that, but I, I, I like him too. But I said, I mean, my, I would have been out of control. Like I would have been a maniac. He's home. I call him like a homegrown player. Um, same coach for all those years. I mean, I don't really know much about him. I only know what I, I kind of research a little bit and dig into what, whatever I can dig into. So his patterns are developing off Medvedev, which is developing off Nadal. Like these, he plays load combos to the backhand corner of the righties. And it's, it's a load combo and it's a mixed combo. But it was fun this week to, to look at four of his matches and see how he uses his combos. And, and they're mentally draining. Like, so for instance, in the Bayana match, like it cracked me up because that guy just ran into a buzz off. Like he had no clue what he was getting into. And, and Brooksby is still, nobody respects him. And you can see it in his, his attitude. And that's where I, I kind of understand where he's coming from because uh, he wants respect. He's earning mm. respect. He's not getting it, it, but he's beating these guys like Sitsipas and, and uh, you know, put Djokovic on. Like I thought he was going to beat Djokovic at the open. Like he would, for a set and a half, he was like, they're like, who is this guy? How is he playing this well? But I like his style. He's developed that that load pattern, that mixed load pattern that is is very frustrating. He uses them early in the game and he uses them at the end of games. And it's almost like sending a message like, hey, you're getting a load combo and you're going to have to deal with this. If you can't deal with this mentally, this is going to happen game after game after game. Mm. And you're going to crack before I crack because I'm not cracking. So he's, he's mentally strong. He's very smart. Um, I'm sure off the court. I'm sure he's, he's a very smart kid. Just like Medvedev is very smart. Um, Nadal is very smart, but you know, Djokovic is very smart, but all these guys that have these, these load combos and are very smart people. Um, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, they be, it becomes kind of like a chess game for them. Like how they, how they treat the court and how they, the dimensions of the court and how they build their patterns. But for the uninitiated, like what is a load combo? How, how would you describe it? So people get what we're talking about. So the, the funny thing that's, that's about tennis is you get, so you get a lot of these juniors, like we were talking about, like how. They're so focused on technique. They're so focused on consistency. There's, and when I say that, they're using the whole court as like just a court. And what happens with these guys is they, Brooksby can go start out the return here. He can hit a second one here, a third one here, fourth. He might go fifth, and then he'll go six. Then he can come back this way, go for seven, eight, nine. 10 so he's hit nine out of 10 shots to the, the backhand corner but it's not just to the backhand corner it's over here over here over here over here over here then he goes over here so he's he's working a pattern or he's setting up for an opportunity what he does with these ones is he then he'll go with just a straight one two three four five six seven 
eight, nine. So he'll do like a, that's a load combo. It's just the one corner and, and he'll just keep it over there. Those are frustrating. You know, yeah. what he's doing is he's, he's mentally wearing down his opponent there. And after a while, if you see the City Pass match, City Pass broke after the, the second set. He was definitely mentally, he was forced to go quick to some shots over here. Well, he, he must work on this shot. He must sit there. I'm trying to think. So he must sit there in the backhand corner mm -hmm. and the coach or the pro feeds ripper feeds like strong feeds into the, the forehand corner and he just goes and turns those cross every time that's what i'm assuming that's what i'd be doing if mm. i were him so he's baiting guys to come to this corner a kind of mixed combo with a load combo it just changes it can be it can start here it can go here so when i talk about grip change combos those are you're trying to keep the person in a small tight box so you're trying to go maybe you can hit the first one here and they hit a forehand, you hit the second one here, you take the third one here. So in this small space, you get them from their forehand grip to the backhand grip to the forehand grip, where it's, if you think of time, it's like, say, I'd have to get a stopwatch out, but say it's, it's like one second, two second, three second, right? So if you do it like that, if you go the traditional route with, this, with the open court combos, say you hit a shot here and you go over here. Well, now that's, one second, two second, three second. Well, it gives a guy enough time to get on his grip change. So that's more of a stretch combo. You can go stretch. You can go. The stretch combos are going to be, can be one, two, three, four. You can alternate. There's so many. There's so many different stretch combos. Like I started writing down the combos to get ready for this. And I was like, wow. I said, I, I think like very simply like this, but then all of a sudden I'm like, well, you can, twitch number you can you can do like a, a one two you can do a wheel combo where it's like you know it's in a row or one two hook around and come back um there's all these combos and the key is, it's funny people can watch this and be like wow i learned something today about combos and it's like well you learn something but it's how do you do it how do you train it that's what the trick yeah. like like i said in our in our intro chat i mean most players for them, like a tennis match is is chaos, right? They start and they're nervous and they don't they don't have a, like a set out strategy, but but practicing even on like you know we talk about UTR six seven or NTRP I guess five four four point five, yeah. getting this kind of rhythm where you're building patterns and maybe focusing on like okay today I'm gonna focus on my load combo so I'm gonna try to break down this guy in a backhand pattern. So let's say you have a good cross court backhand so you can actually build up momentum try to do that open up like uh, a down the line shot for example yeah. and then like when you started to master that then you can go into maybe okay now it's a stretch combo which is i think what most people are trying to do when you look at like club matches if they have some decent skill is that they're trying to always go corner 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 like they're trying to play almost like impossible shots you know which makes them yeah. hit too many unforced errors you know so I, I think thinking around this is very useful for for many players so when I break down Brooksby's matches, he's he's using using mixed and load combos to start games. He's doing it to end games. In between, he's, if he's up, he's using stretch combos. And you'll mm -hmm. see Djokovic does that too. Um, because So if you turn it around and look at Tsitsipas, Tsitsipas plays a lot of stretch combos. He plays too aggressively, but the thing he does well is, well, he's a big dude and he can hit the ball good. Um, but on a side note, that's where I alluded to him with that Twitter, like whatever it was on Instagram or Twitter, where he he said Brooksby's not very athletic. And I laughed because I wrote it in a piece. I said, he, he's a mechanic. Like you're, when you're a mechanic, you're you're very, you had a million balls as a youth and you're not necessarily the most gifted kid, but you work really hard. So you're a good worker um, because you can see in his grip on his, his slice is, is, is a strong grip. It's not a loose grip. So he can't play with his slice as much. But when I see that Baena play and like, I don't know, I've never seen, like I never studied him before, but when I look at his stroke, I like, he must get hand feeds. He must do a lot of feeding drills. He must do a lot of stuff because he, like Brooksby was grip changing him the whole time. And he, like, he didn't realize anything what was going on. Like I, I guarantee he didn't expect to lose the Brooksby, but, um, but, when, but if you look at the match, like Brooksby wiped him out, like he just, he outsmarted him basically. Mm. So 
you you want to divert to like a, the tennis books, right? So I want to be a good player. When I'm a kid, I go, I like, well, I study all the tennis books. What tennis books are out there? I read a bunch of tennis books. And I, I didn't, I read almost all of them. And, and I laugh. I, I learned more from books that aren't related to tennis. Like the book of five rings um, is a good book. I recently, I read a book by Sam Sheridan called the fighter. Was it the fighter's mind? Yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah. And what it does is, he, if you look at MMA in the form of just a sport, some of the stuff he talks about is like the stuff I think about when I'm on the tennis court. So when I look at like training, for instance, you can do a simple drill of um, put a box here, put a box here, and you can alternate alternate between the boxes to work on your control because you're working on your contact. You're not working on your swing. All these kids are working on their technical swing. Mm. I can destroy it. Like, like I could be 57 or 67 years old. If I lost to an eight or nine UTR, even at 65, I'd be upset with myself because the, the grip changing that they have to do is like, you can catch them on quick combos. You catch, catch them on quicks and they have no idea what they're doing because they're so focused on their swing. Um, you can just do simple ones like this. You can, I mean, if you even want to do a wheel combo, you can do a, a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You can do open. So once you do like some, like call those simple combos because the player over here knows what you're doing. So it's going to, you're just going to go from one spot to the next. You can go this way. You can go this way and go one, two, three. You can go this way. Fine. And then what you do is you do open. There's no, there's no number. And so now the person over here has to, so that's the real important part is like what, how to read your opponent and when they're going to go. So now is someone really going to take this one combo all the time? Like start out their combo here. It's a tough combo to start on. So they're mostly going to start here or whatever cross court they're out of. They're mostly going to start that, that one, but the kids don't learn that when they're just hitting cross courts all the time. I, I pretty much stopped doing that with, the better players because I just don't see any value in, in cross courts and who can hit 50 in a row and turn them into a machine. But there's value in that. If I cared about like how I looked, if I was more focused on me and how I look and like, Oh, I got to make sure all my players are very consistent and Hey, they can go to the tournaments and lose, but the parents are happy because look at, they, they don't miss anything in practice, but you know, at a certain point, you, you're not really teaching tennis. You, you, you just, you're just a facilitator. So I had this one player who's a talented player and he was out warming up. I'm by myself working six courts and I peek over at him because he was playing a player I already knew. He was, he was a couple years older. He was already, I already watched this kid play for a couple years. He's already beaten the players I coached for the last couple of years. And I watched my guy in a warm, warm up with him and I just laughed. I just giggled in my head and I was like, oh man, I got to go. I got to go talk to this kid before the match starts. So I walk over and I talk to him. And the other kid had the ugliest strokes ever. He was, he was almost like a poor man's Brooksby. Like, like not saying Brooksby is, you know, Brooksby is a bad swinger of the ball, but this kid's strokes were, were really, really awful. But he was very good at winning. And so I went over and I talked to the player. I said, listen, I said, I already know what you're thinking about. You're thinking you're going to wipe this guy out. But let me tell you, I already watched this kid win and beat good players. Even from, from he puts a, in this one division I was coaching in the Patriot League, they got West Point, they got Navy. I said, he gives a lot of people trouble and you don't get it. Like you're not understanding, you're just a freshman and you don't, you play junior tennis and you come to college and you don't get it. And then after he got, I swear he got double bageled. It was like, oh, and one. And he comes off the court and he's like, you're exactly right. He's like, I was just so focused on how ugly this kid's strokes were. <laughs> and I said, yeah. and I told you what was going to happen. I, and I knew, I knew he was going to lose and there's nothing I could do about it. And so I just let him lose. But for me, depends on the level you're coaching. It's like, for me, life is about learning, right? So if I'm not about, I don't need any vindication of who I am and who I am as a coach. Like I know what I can do and what I can't do. So when I go out there, it's more important for me for someone to learn because these kids aren't going pro. The kids at the college level, a lot of them aren't going pro. At the junior level, a lot of them aren't going pro. As much as they think they will, they're not. And, you know, like even for instance, for my daughter, my daughter will, she'll train she literally hits five hours a week. These kids are playing 10 to 15 hours a week that she's playing against. And she, but when we work, we're working on combos. We're working on combos and the success isn't today. It's not tomorrow. The hope is that'll be when she's 15 or 16, she'll have a lot of combo combos under her belt that she can utilize and she can make them her way. 
Like I don't, I don't try to tell her what to do. I let her learn because like what I said about the swing is like when you're teaching kids to swing. So for instance, like when I start tennis at 14 or 15 years old, I lost something. Like when you're that age and you start, sometimes I had to rehearse my swing. Even if I was 20 in my twenties and I didn't touch a ball for a couple of days, I'd have to swing the racket in the backyard or I'd have to like rehearse the swing a little bit because it was never my own. Like it was what always what people were telling me to do kind of sort of, but I was trying to do it a different way, but either way, it was never molded into my head. But when the kids start at nine years old or six years old or 11 years old, the brain is still developing. So what happens is when I let my daughter swing the way she wants to swing, like I have so many people that will say like, Oh, your daughter's swing is too big. Uh, she, she, got, I'm like, who cares? Like let her swing her way. She'll figure it out. She has to figure it out. I can't tell her to shorten her swing and be a cookie cutter swing. And there's tricks to it. Like, so for instance, say you had a big swing um, and people are telling you to, to not do that big swing anymore. What you do is you just stick somebody at the net. You just stick a player at the net and they volley at you. So it comes back quicker. So then you're forced to short set. So if you short set you, over time and you play a lot of volley versus baseline games, you're going to start short setting a lot more without even thinking about it. And yeah, yeah, and that, that drill is very good actually for you, for people with, with very long swings. So when I pick on some of the players, like, like I'll use Bayana as one because I recently did that thing on him. I know he hits a lot of cross courts. He's a very good player. He's top 100. Um, I don't know exactly where he is, but like like Ivashka, like when he has that that uh, that step move on his backhand, I'm like, the pros got to know that stuff. Like they, he, you can catch him. So with Ivashka, you can, you hit him here, hit him here. Then you hit him here, hit him here. You can literally alternate here and then you just open up a little bit. And he's got no answer for it because he has a hard step on his right foot. When you have a hard step on it, you can get him on, on a, he can't release his hip. He can't release his, his hip on the back end. So he's going to have a tough time to catch, to get the ball across the court. So a lot of his balls are going to land over here. I know that, but, but then, so coming back to who I am, like, who am I? I'm a nobody. Like I, I live in Western Massachusetts. I call this the graveyard of tennis. Yeah. And then one of the things that popped up this week, one of, so I have a, a buddy I grew up with. He's like a four or five. So he's maybe like a UTR. I don't know what that means. Seven, eight. I don't know. I mean, probably about like, yeah, probably about seven and a half to eight and a half. He said to me, some of the, some of the players at the tennis club are, they watch these videos at the, the BNP and they see these, the pros hitting this casual hitting. And I said, and I laughed. I said, that's fake. They're like, it's on YouTube. It's all over YouTube, all the pros hitting these casual hits. I said, they're doing casual hits because they just played a three or four hour match or they played a two and a half hour match. So they just want to touch a few balls and they want to get on with the day. But if they lose first round, if their first round is their first round, then they got to go back to training. Then yeah. all of a sudden you have like five days of training. You can actually go back and train a little bit. I said, it's like lifting weights. It's like, if you lift weights for six months and take a month off you're still back where you didn't lose anything but if you take if you work out for six months and you take six months off you got to start back from scratch again so what these the club players don't realize is these players they so they'll go out and hit like that they'll do some casual hits while they're hitting for an hour or two during a week and then they'll go play matches and i'm like well you're not really working on anything you're not working on combos you, you get forced to play aggressive combos because that's what the game dictates for the club player is you mm. play aggressive combos and if you're off they say, oh, I was, uh, I was on today, you know, like I won. Then if they're off, they're like, oh, I wasn't playing good. And what happens is the players have to learn. So I always tell some of the, te the kids I teach, the, the younger ones, I'll say, you're not a player until you, you can play bad and win. You can beat a good player and just play bad because I always thought you had to play good to win. You have to hit winners. You have to play, you have to hit strong shots. You have to look good up. Oh, there's some girls walking by. They're going to think I'm a bad player. There's some, some club players who know, who know me. I got to show them I can hit the ball hard. It doesn't matter. What matters is winning. Like, like, so I had to figure that out when I was young and going through college. Still, I was like more about aesthetics and how I looked. And I think that's a really common thing uh, among players. Like if you listen to what's, I mean, they, they had this thing on Essential Tennis, another YouTube channel. Uh, with this most exhausting player from, I think, Atlanta or something, where he's just, he has no real tennis technique. He's just slicing the ball, but he's still, a, you know, NTRP 4.5, still winning against players that have much better looking shots, but they, they 
simply break down. You can't deal with it because he puts them in awkward space situations all the time and he doesn't miss. But then people say, oh, this is a clown. You know, he doesn't play tennis. Well, it's tennis, but he's just finding his way to play tennis and you have to deal with it. You know, you can't really complain. Why do I not beat this guy? We all lose to some of those players, whether, whatever level you are, because right now, like, you know that when the, the pros are in the locker room, they're like snickering at like, haha, you just lost to Brooksby. You just lost to Brooksby. And it's like, hey, the kid's good. Like the kid's, he's, he's going to break your mind. If you don't, if you got a good mind, he'll get you. Like, I, so I look at a match and I look at the next match. Did this person make an adjustment? Did this player make an adjustment? And it's like, so in terms of what people don't realize, I can sit here and look at it and say, well, Medvedev needs, needs to work on his volleys. Well, I'll tell you, he's working on his volleys. He's 100%. He's working on, he wants to be like, like I'm going to say, he wants to be like Nadal. He wants to finish at the net. It just takes time to get that under the yep. big matches. And, but you can look at it and be like, well, I know what his problem is if he came forward more. And it's like, buddy, it takes like six months. It takes six months to a year. Like with these combos, it takes, it takes a long time to get these yeah. combos. But these people spend time working on their technique and they're not working on combos. It's like you're wasting your time. You're literally taking that time and throwing it in the trash because you have to work on combos. Like there's no other way to do it. If you want to be a good player, you have to work on combos. And there's like a bunch of those drills. But for, so for instance, like I wrote down a couple of drills. Um, so Bayana in the second set, by the time he realized, oh crap, I'm going to lose to this guy. I better start doing something different. He started hitting a few drop shots. He started doing a few things that worked but it was a little too late. So then Hashinoff plays him and Hashinoff is like, he expected to beat the guy. Well, there was a couple big games early on, but like, I think I wrote in a piece where in the second game, I swear four out of six points were load, big load combos. And he broke his mind. He broke mm. them right in that game. And I laughed about it because again, it wasn't until the second set that he, he, he started like changing up a few things and doing that. And then City Pass must have watched some of those points or the coaches. Or Thomas Angus is, was a great player. I like Thomas Angus. Um, you know, obviously, I don't know the guy, but I remember watching him play. And whenever I, back in the day, he was playing, I was watching. Um, he had like a, from what I remember, like a slappy forehand, like an aggressive forehand. Yeah. Solid backhand. The volleys were, were all right. He had a funny serve, but it was effective. Um, but I think he was a top 10 player. I'm pretty sure he was. Um, so this, so I'll look at like, what's Sissy Pass going to do? Now that his dad's not on his shoulder, um, I look for the adjustments and I like what I saw and I hope, I hope he can do well. Um, cause he's got a lot of games, he's got a lot of potential, you know, <laughs> even though he's a mechanic. Uh, when you play someone like a Brooksby, you want to get to this corner here, but you don't want to start out here. You can start out center. You can start outside. And what Sitsipas was doing, I guarantee Ankvist was saying this, is he was stepping into the court. He was stepping into the court and taking time away. So I try to show my daughter this, but she doesn't get it yet. Maybe she'll get it when she's older. Maybe she won't. But I try to teach her that it's recovery time. It's you're trying to take away recovery time. And if you watch Sitsipas, when he steps into the court, even three feet or four, three to four feet of stepping into the court takes away three to four feet of the the recovery time so when he steps in and takes that ball early and hits it to this corner he's not able to hit like a great shot obviously mm. like i mean this seems like everyone kind of knows that i guess you want to go say here 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 you want to pull him off and get him in this area here and then you want to get over to the sideline here so the guys like uh cameron nori who have that shovel low shovel backhand yeah you want to keep them down low too if you can skid the ball down low to that corner he, he struggles with that shot. So I'm curious if Feder was around. Feder, I would assume, would play like a, some short slice here and some slice in this corner, but also use like maybe a drop shot to hide to hide what he's doing with this. He'll use a drop over here, maybe a backdoor. I call it a backdoor slice. When you, you're kind of opening the court, and that's like I call it a backdoor, when you're, when you're flip-flopping, and then you're, you're playing a backdoor slice, and you have to – I always tell people with every position on the court, you at least need two options. Three options yeah. even better, but the more options you have, the more maintenance on your games. So how will you go about the training? Like, let's say if you want to learn a certain combo pattern, like how, well, how would you train your daughter, for example, to, to work yeah. on like a certain combo, a load combo or a mixed combo? So she's not ready for any of those. So for her, a load combo is like your typical pusher combo, just push the yeah. ball back. So for instance, what I say to her, so 
did, she played a, a match this weekend. She makes me laugh. She cracks me up. Um, I teach her the slice backhand. It's a very solid slice backhand for a 13 year old. A lot of 13 year olds don't slice it that well, but I, I work on it and work on it and work on it. Um, so she played a big girl. That's so my daughter was 13. She played a 16 under tournament. The girl she played is probably was probably 15 or 16. Okay. Outweighed her by a bit, like Eastern foreign ripped the ball, smoked everything. It was all smokes. And but my daughter got her, say she sliced down a line 10 times. She had two good ones that double bounced, like the girl couldn't get to the ball because she hit it too good and it stayed too low. The other eight times with an eastern forehand, right there. And mm. I tell her, I, I always tell my daughter, it's a hit cover. Hit cover means hit your slice down a line cover the cross i go the eastern foreign you want them to try to beat you down this line it's okay if they beat you here just don't let them get the easy shot so what you're doing is i'm i'm whenever i hit a slice down a line i'm playing them to play the ball here because i want to go it's like a zigzag it's like i go here they go here i go here yeah and what i'll do is i'll keep doing that pattern to get them to shift past that hash mark that middle hash mark once they get over here i'll go hit here hit here and I'll go back over here. So that comes back to my manipulation. I like manipulating their opponent, but I'm also paying attention to my patterns. I'm, and and I, I'm just aware of it. But my daughter, she, so after the, the match, I said, hey, you hit 10 slice down a line, roughly. I didn't, I didn't count exactly, but it was about 10. I said, yeah, you won two of those points, but eight of those ones, she turned cross on you and you weren't covering the cross. Like that's, where else was she going to go? She goes, well, that's boring. And I said, boring. I go, what's, what's boring? I go, what's winning? Winning is boring. I go, you can be boring and win. She goes, well, I don't want to play that way. And I'm like, okay. So guess what? So this week, or not say this week, it's going to take me some time to, to break her down. So I'm, I'm going to teach her how the middle of the court's effective. So I'm going to put a box here and I'm going to tell her she can only hit into that box. I can hit anywhere. And I'm going to play her to 21 in a ground stroke game, and I'm going to, I'm going to wipe her out. <laughs> now, I'm going to reverse it, and I'm going to tell her I can only hit to that box. And then and I said, and I'm still going to wipe you out. And I said, I'm going to show you how effective the middle of the court is. But if they don't do this drill, like even at college, they don't do enough of this. You can, you, so, for instance, if you hit this drill and you just did it for 20 minutes, it means nothing. Again, it, it's just hitting. It's just training. It's just hitting. But if you play a 21, doing it from a ground stroke game perspective, you actually learn when you can use it, when you can't. Well, now it's a score. Now you're, if you're the one up here who can hit anywhere, you can control the combos and you can control because you know they have to come back to you. Um, so I'll do a game like that where they can only hit to one spot. I'll do another game where you just have to hit three. I'll put a number, it could be three, could be four, could be five. You have to hit three, four or five shots to this spot here. But if you don't win the point by then, then the point goes open. So there's like, there's other little stuff you can do like that, that. But here's the thing. You do it one time or do it for a week, it doesn't set in. You need, I don't know what the formula is, but could be, I don't know, maybe if you do this for two, three months, and then you, you make them do that in turn. So for instance, like my daughter, I told her, I, when you go play a match, once per game, I want you to play a load combo. Just pick a corner and just only hit to that corner so that in the hopes that she can start adding that to at least once a game, she gets to play a load combo. When you look at the Bayana match with Brooksby, he played a load combo one per game. And that was enough to, to get a, like almost like a, what was it? I don't know if it was 6-0 or 6-1 the first set, but it was a crush. I think it was 6-0. Um, but did he do it to like specifically the backhand or did he try yeah, to yeah. like different? Yeah all pretty much all the same combo you might change up the number a little bit but it was like a one two three then a move and then a four five six so there's so that's a funny one too when it's a, a one one two three four or five six seven that's like a simple one like so those are like simple simple load combos that you can do at home or you can do um, at your local tennis club the mixed ones are when you're doing a one two three four, five, six, and that. So here's the other side trick to combo. You're not going into the point saying, okay, I'm gonna do a load combo on this point. And then the person gives you a short ball on the first one, you're like, oh crap, now I gotta come in for uh, an approach shot. Um, you, 
you're using the load combo when you can use it. So for instance, if I say, okay, I'm playing Jonas and I want to do a load combo early in the game. Well, you ace me on the first point. You, I missed the return on the second point. We never got the blow. I never got that early load combo. And now all of a sudden I never got to use it that game. Well, I don't want to use it maybe on my service game. So I got to play my service game. Next thing I play two games. And I haven't played my load combo yet. It matters who you're playing too. Cause if the guy's always hitting short, you got to work on short balls. So back to like that Sam Sheridan book, I don't know, people should really read that book and then relate it to tennis because I talked about the MMA fighters, just like tennis players, but they didn't, they didn't reference any tennis players. But what they said was the MMA fighters who do well are the guys who, who practice different things and try different things, not the guys who do the same thing over and over and over. But in tennis, you see if someone's winning, they just keep doing it. What's winning. And they don't realize once they get enough mental reps of, of doing it, say pushing for an example. So if you're a seven UTR and under pushing can win, you know, you're like that guy in Atlanta, the essential tennis, mm. he can win matches, but I think he understands he's not going pro. He, he knows he's, a, a, yeah. probably not tall. he's just, he's just annoying people and he, he gets enjoyment out of beating players who take tennis really serious. And he just, he just loves like just going out there and beating these players who, who think they're better than him. Um, one of the trends I see at the indoor with club players or with the juniors is they hit their short balls like a baseline shot. They don't break on the contact. So again, coming back to like a volley, your body is the, the finish. So mm. if, if you're moving up on a short ball and you break on it, your body weight through the punch, through the, I call it the body punch, your punch through is gives you the weight of the ball plus the snap of the wrist. But I see a lot of these people finish it like it's baseline shot. It's like they don't get the difference between like a short ball and a, and a baseline shot. The baseline shot's obviously longer. The short ball is shorter. But when I was a kid, the coaches were always like, you got to add more spin. You got to brush up more. Well, brush up. When a, when, so I'll tell you. So look on, like on the side. So a brush up when it goes like this, it's not on the ball that long. A brush out is mm. more. So when I hit contact here and I keep going through like this, that's what you're supposed to do on the short ball and even you're supposed to do on your baseline shots too but when they brush up on the ball like i can just like to teach to, to beat a brush up finish is so easy it's 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 high ball low ball it's should go you you take them out of a window so you say the window is like the here mm. you make them go out of a window and i call that window tennis is when you when you take the ball flight into account you start going low and high low and high when you play someone with a brush up finish it's literally just low and high. That's all you have to do. You have to just change ball flight. A lot of these future players, what they do is they hit the same ball flight. They, they literally hit pounders. What I say, low pounders that go about waist level and below to the corners. So over time, it's like, yeah, you can win the first set 6-1 or 6-2 or 6-0. But in the second set, if you're hitting low pounders, first ball, um, after the serve, your serve plus one. The guy's going to figure it out. These guys are good players. Even the future players are, are no different than the pros to a certain mm, degree. Of course. With their contact they just they just literally play the same shot over over and over there, there's two types of futures players there's counter punchers who are ex-college players and 26 years old and there's young guys who are 15 trying to be up and comers you take a box like here say you call it a one box whatever and i serve and that's where i'm gonna put my first ball well if you go to my backhand i can play i can play a slice i can play my two-hander and my style is my my two handers are like I won't say Safin-esque. I'm older than Safin, so I like to say his backhand's like mine. But um, but I had my backhand. My backhand's always my better shot. I'm a righty who bats lefty. I love, I, like I so said, I play golf lefty. I bat mm, okay, lefty. Right. So my backhand never, never fails me usually. So I mix up my power with my slice to this corner. Well, now if you come to this side um, off the return, I still say I go to that corner still but I do it with different ball flights. If I can just hit pounders and I'm going to get you off the court, I'll just hit pounders the whole time. That's easy. But if you're starting to get on the run and you're starting to put that ball back in a tough position, I'll start going high with my first ball. Like, so I'll start hitting a ball above your shoulder on that first ball where you're forced to lift your hands up on it. If you popcorn it, I'm coming in and I don't let things go unattested. I call it like twice. If I, so I call it probing. So when I, when I probe somebody, I usually do it in the warm up. So people use the warm up to warm up. I use the warm up for probing. Um, if I don't know you, so what I, I'll test you. So I'll be hitting a couple of regular shots. I'll throw a high ball to your back end. If you float the ball back to me, I'm going to be I already know. So we could have just warmed up for, for a minute and I already know I'm taking my first ball high to your back end. Cause I want to start building a game, um, building a lead. 
Mm-hmm. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll catch it in a one, I'll catch a fly in a one four. I'll be hitting with you. I'll slice to your forehand. Ball comes back deep. Okay. I'll be hitting with you. I'll slice to your back end. The ball comes back or it goes into the net. You'll never see it again. I never warm up a weakness. I just, I'll sit there. If your forehand is better, I'll just hit to your forehand the whole time in a warm up. And then sometimes occasionally back in the day, could you hit me some backhands? Oh, sure. I'll feed it to your back and then I'll go back to your forehand. So I'm, I'm being a little sneaky and I just laugh about it. But what happens is this is for club players more. I mean, the pros that know each other it is what it is at the pro level. But when I throw that high ball up and I already saw that you're going to pop that corn at one in the warm up, I'm coming in all day. I'm not letting you float anything above my shoulder back to the baseline. I just come in and put away the volley. I just keep coming in all day. And I kind of, I call that like, squeezing time like python tennis it's like i'm gonna squeeze you i'm gonna make you feel like you better do something or or you're gonna or i'm gonna come in and put it away then sometimes i'll sit back and stay back and i'll let you feel com- comfortable so i know we're doing a zoom but the way i describe it when i'm face to face with people is i get up in their personal space mm. i go is that fun for me to talk this close to you like like right in your face and you're like jeez and uh, I said, well, that's what I do you on the tennis court. I squeeze time from you. I squeeze time and then I give you your space. We talk from five feet away. You feel comfortable. Once I keep inching in forward, inching in forward, it, uh, that's basically how I play my tennis. I'm kind of always squeezing people and then giving them space, squeezing people in, in different ways and giving them space. But that's kind of like the format I teach certain players. What determines a weakness is where the mistakes are and where the balls are landing. So if I'm warming up to you and your forehands keep landing at the service line, I know that's your weak side. If you look good and you heavy spin, but you keep landing at the service line, it's your weak side. If some people have a weak side forehand and a strong side backhand where their backhand is just flat, flattish and can, can kind of catch you with speed, the club players get caught by those kind of games. And uh, But I'll know, they'll be like, oh, the backhand's weaker because it's it flies lower and it's this. I'm like, no. I'm like, I would build on the forehand side and go after the backhand side when I'm up in the game. And they're like, well, why would you do that? I'm like, because I want the short balls. I want like the shortish shots. I'll go after the back. And if I start off on the back end, they're putting the ball back to the baseline and you can't get in. And I, I even watch like the old ladies play. And I'd be like, why is this lady not understanding? This lady keeps playing the same pattern over and over again. And I'd laugh and I, I never understood why. But as an adult, I'm like, they just were playing. They weren't thinking about the other person. Or so, I call it selfish thinking. Everyone thinks about themselves, right? They use the warm up to warm up their game. I use the warm up for assessment only. I'm only, I'm there to assess. I really like, for instance, like my, my mom would come to my matches when I was younger and she'd be like, she goes, Oh, after the warm, I thought you were going to get your butt kicked. And I was like, mom, I go, I don't care about the warm. I'm just trying to figure things out. Cause I want to know how I want to start the match. I've never played this guy before. So I want to figure out what he likes and what he doesn't like. And, and I'll never forget when I think of the park, I think of this one match, I played this kid. And what happened was there was a local watching a match, a local guy who knew me from the local tennis club. And so as a joke, I don't know why I did this, but as a joke, the kid's right next to me that I'm playing. And I said, hey, you know, whatever the guy's name was, I was like, if this kid drop shots me anymore, I'm done. I'm toast. I'm out of shape. It was a total lie. I was totally in shape. I just said that because I was wondering if he was listening to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And what did the kid do? He hit like 10 drop shots in the next 20 points. I just ran up to him, dropped him back over the net where I ran up and I put him away. And I was like, what a bonehead. Like, this kid was listening to me. Why would I tell you a weakness? Like, so that's when I started learning manipulation, like verbal manipulation. And I started, like, messing around with my opponents a little bit. Even at 47, there's kids. So my weight, my racket weight is about 360. And that's where I like it. I, I could go a little higher. And what happens is every heavy ball you give me, I just plow it. I just plow it. It does it has no effect to my racket. To the, so it's a prestige. So it's a head prestige, the new one. I, you, I played it with a lot of different rackets recently but anyway so i put i weighted it back up to my college weight and i laugh at like how these guys like are like del potro he's got that big three i don't know he's like 380 i thought or something I last i knew i thought was that where he was at like 380 yeah around 370s higher at least 373 or something yeah, yeah and it, it hits well, the ball I, like a tank it's also extended right so the swing weight is pretty I call yeah. it like a soggy like a soggy wet ball so so recently i up my i put my weight back to college weight well you have to play with a racket enough so i'm used to it i played all my years with weight picture i had four strips about you know the size of the the side of the racket in college four strips on both sides the the thing must have weighed about close to 400 my ball didn't bounce my backhand just slid right through the court the amount of times people like went to set up to hit a forehand is just like slid right by (laughs) 
especially on fast course, I would laugh. And now that young guys are playing with the 320 to 340, I assume. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. So Yeah, you see, you're seeing definitely a, a decrease in... I mean, you guys like Rublev, Medvedev, they still play heavy. They still play like 355, 360, high swing weights, relatively high. But then you have guys like, you know, Tiafo um, and like Alcaraz pretty relatively light, you know. So uh, even Sinner is a little bit lighter in, in static weight at least. So it's because it's, they Absolutely. swing so fast, like the, the racket head speed is just like out of this world. So it's, it's like they can't generate yeah. that with a 360 gram. It's not going to work. Yeah, because the weight deadens the frame, so it, you can't yeah. hit as much spin, so it kills a spin. But, but I'd be surprised. I bet you Brooksby plays with some weight. I bet you his racket's weighted. Like I'd be surprised if it's not, because when he, even though he's six four, if he swings and the ball keeps going back to the baseline, so that's one of the things I noticed this week when I up, I put my weight back up from like, you know, up to three sixty, was my backhands. I remember when I was young, my backhands always went back to the baseline. I don't care what you gave me, how fast it was, what it went, always went back to the baseline. And over the years, I stopped using weight and I go, with, you know, try out new rackets. You know, I, I don't weight it anymore. And I, I call it clunky. You get a couple of clunkers in there where you hit and then my ball lands shorter. I'm like, man, I'm getting old. Like I'm getting old. So I weight my racket back up to 360. The ball is going back to the baseline. So when some of the players I teach will be like, should I put more weight on my racket? I said, ah. I said, I like my racket at 360. Everyone's going to have a weight that they like. And I said, I like mine at 360. That's, I, I learned that that's my playing weight. If I play with the prestige, if I play with like the blade, I mean, I, I waited the, the new blade, but, um, but it was bugging my shoulders. I don't know what it was about the stiffness to the, the shock of the hit. My shoulders were bugging me. Both mm -hmm. shoulders, I roll them out after three, four hours of hitting. And compare like, so you, the prestige felt better at the high weight than the blade. But here's the funny thing is like if I if I play a match, I'll go, I'd rather turn back to like a, a battle out VS where I can control the spin. When I play with the prestige, I play too too aggressive. So when I get back to Brooksby, he's gotta have a weighted racket because I have the the blade racket. I have a the 18 by 20. And when he just pushes balls back, the, I don't I don't think the people at home realize like they're hitting a good ball. Like I remember I went to the US Open maybe two years ago and I hadn't gone in years. The level, the rally ball level, the speed of the rally ball is so much like if you go back to like the early 2000s, the, the average speed is probably up, to, I don't know, 10, 15 miles an hour. Per yeah, I would, I would guess so as well. Right? Right. And, and the RPMs yeah. must be up as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy how like if you, you're there, you can see it. When you're not there, you don't see that that rally ball is huge. Cause even but these guys are just constant. Like you watch Rublev practice or you watch some of the videos and he's just like boom, boom, boom. he's just like Yeah, yeah, hey, missile, missile. Swing, swing, swing. And I just laugh because it's I'm like, man, it must be nice to be young again, like to be able to swing a racket like that instead of but I remember back in the day the, the coach would be like you're swinging too fast you need to slow down you need to be consistent i was like no i want to swing fast they're like no 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 you gotta be you gotta be controlled and i was like oh my god and then look at now these guys are swinging i mean i don't know what their racket swing speeds are but they're pretty fast they're pretty quick you alluded to it that uh, alcaraz could be the next uh, good one but maybe other people did it. i don't really follow other people but you opened my eyes to to looking at him and i looked at him and i said "Ooh, this clay course season is going to be interesting he's yeah. gonna just some people he so you look at brooksby when he goes to the clay court season i really think he's going to struggle i but i hope hey who knows i hope he can surprise me if he i'm assuming he's going to play like the circuit the, the clay circuit but alcaraz I, like i want to see that guy play somewhat like a brooksby and, and brooksby's going to get shellacked play to play i, I want to play with a more spinny racket that i can control the, the ball flight when like i said when i play with the prestige i'm just it's more manipulation. I just more manipulate what I'm doing, um, what location I'm using. But if I have a pure, like a, a Babolat racket, I can not only hit the same location, but I can hit it with different types of spin, high spin, low spin. Um, the only issue I have with the Babolats is you can't weight them that much. It, so a typical clinic up here, up in the north, and it probably is the same at IMG to a certain degree in all those academies is ground strokes for an hour, warm up volleys for about five minutes, and then start playing ground stroke points. That's typical American clinic. If you want to put it in a nutshell, you hit volleys for about five or 10 minutes. Like when I was a kid, we, I just spent a lot of time. We call it the butterfly drill, where you 
like on the court where if you have a, a player here and you get the volleyer here, we would go outside the outside, inside the inside. Yeah, yeah, I've done that one. Yeah, yeah. And we go outside, inside, outside, inside, mm. but it's a control drill, so it's really tough. But on a side note, there's one drill that is still being used today. Even as a kid, it drove me bonkers. I don't think you probably have done this one. We've all done it. It's uh, the one where you go cross court and I go down the line. Yeah, I, I did that uh, yesterday. <laughs> oh, I don't want to. I want to hit you with a wet noodle or something because uh, that one drives me crazy. Because it's a control drill, which is fine if you want to move and stuff, but um, but it forces you to take the swing speed down. So the the alternate to do that, if you want to do that drill, what I say the, the right way, and I, I still now I'm more about combos. Um, you just have the guy sit in the corner and he just has to alternate. If you want to get conditioning, you just go alternate, alternate, alternate. You can go 20 until the guy gets 20 in a row. It can take a while to go 40 in a row. Um, that's when it's like 90 degrees. And I, I just feel like I haven't, I've been eating a bunch of junk food and, uh, and I want to just shed some of that. I want to shed about five pounds. I'll have the, the kids control. I'll go, okay, we're going to work on control. You're going to run me side to side, but really, Yes, it's for them and their contact point to control the contact point because it's a little earlier on the cross, a little later on the down line. But I want to do that to shed about five pounds. So I just I just want to sweat. So one of the ones I, I would suggest to to add to that is you just take two spots. Say you take a spot here and say you got this one and this one. So call that one and two. You can hit to these ones as much as you want. You can just sit here and hit four in a row, then go over here and you're working on the guy. He's got to figure out when is this, when is Jonas going to move the ball? And so you're working actually on your combo, but so you can do it there. You can do it to here to here. It's a moving combo, but it, it, it works on just a little bit of the contact point. So I'm more about the contact point than the technique because that's more important to me. Where can you put the ball? Can you put the ball here? Can you put it there? And a lot of times people don't realize to go cross court to the extreme corner, you're a little bit earlier to go here. You're a little bit later. But when I wrote you a piece way early in the early stages about consistency and this myth about consistency and all these coaches, like 50 in a row, 50, like consistency, if you hit to a spot consistently, you can make be consistent. Like it doesn't matter how hard you hit the ball. And for instance, like recently, because one of the pieces I wrote, I was like, watched a match all day on a Saturday and a little bit in a Sunday morning while I was really tired. I showed up for a lesson. I had one hit on a Sunday. I couldn't hit a forehand. I laughed. I was like, you got to be kidding me. All like I, my forehand was like so shaky. And what happened was by the end of the hit, because my brain was so many different ways, so many going so many different ways. I said to myself, what are you doing? I go hit to a spot. Stop focusing on your technique or anything. What's wrong with your technique? Hit to a spot on the court. Next thing you know, my timing came back like very quickly. And I was like, even I fall for it sometimes. Like mentally, if you're, you're, your mind's all these other places instead of being where you are, um, I always forget to just focus on a spot. Even if you're playing bad in a match, just focus on one spot in the court, usually the backhand corner. But if you focus on a spot, your timing comes back fairly quickly. And then you can get back to moving the ball around again. Thanks for talking. Take care, right. man. We'll keep in touch, okay? Okay. See ya. Thanks, man. Ciao, ciao.